Good afternoon. Uh, this is going to be a mini series of lectures on what we call a foundation course in mathematics. Because when students come to BSc and MSc, the teachers believe they already know something about sets, set theoretic operations and functions, etc. That much of knowledge is enough. And so they don't spend time on explaining the intricacies and also the abstract way of writing a proof using those things. So in MPTS, we I have been doing this for the last 25 odd years and now we have to also publish a book on that. So this is going to be a crash course because this we plan to use it for students who join level 1 and level 2 who have not gone through our level 1 course because we have something like 12 lectures and foundations okay in level O and that gives a very solid thorough grounding to students so that when you go to BSc, MSc, abstract highly high, high level abstract mathematics you understand what is happening okay many students do not even know what is arbitrary union what is inverse image and what is a partial order what is the difference between maximal and maximum elements right all these things will be taken care but it will be slightly faster okay the pace will be slightly faster because I expect okay the students the audience will be finally students of BSc and onwards okay but if you are a second year or first year BSc students please wait there will be a long course which will be about 12 lectures okay so with this let me start the thing yeah the right See, in mathematics, one of the first things you should know is, as you might already have seen, many of the proofs, at least very substantial part of the proof, is proved by contradiction. So you are given a statement, and then you are assuming it's false, you want to prove a statement, you assume it's false, that means you have to negate the statement and try to arrive at some contradiction. And usually these kind of statements in mathematics will involve what are known as quantifiers. I will explain all those things. Okay. So, our goal, the, this lecture will be concentrating on quantifiers and negations. Okay. So, suppose I have a statement something like this. Okay. Every leaf on this tree is green. Green. You see that? Now, there is a quantifier involved. Okay. The quantifier is every. Usually you write it as read and you read it as for all, all for each, okay, also given. Okay, we will come to that in a minute. Right? And you there is also another one which says there exists a green, let us say brown leaf on this tree yeah. okay now there is a this is a quantifier which you usually do not by there exists you usually say there exists right so these are known as quantifiers this quantifier is known as existential quantifier now these are all jargon you can ignore you don't need it and this is called sorry <laughs> universal quantifier And this is existential quantifier. Okay. Right. The first thing we want to understand is how to negate. Okay. We will give mathematical examples soon, but please bear. If I say uh, every leaf in this tree is green, okay, I want to negate it. That means I want to say it's false. What is it I have to do? That means I have to show there is at least one leaf on the tree which is not green. You don't have to say it's a red, brown or whatever. Okay, what all you have to say is there exists a leaf in the tree which is not green. Do you understand? Right. So similarly, if I say something like, uh, okay, every fan in this room is working. If it is false, what does it mean? It means that there is at least one fan in the room which is not working here. You see that? So the negation okay let us look at these two statements okay there is another thing which you have to learn okay whenever I, there is a quantifier involved 
there is always a set involved okay whenever there is a quantifier presence of quantifier implies the presence of a set okay i will explain that see when i say every leaf on this tree is green this is a set the set is the set of all leaves on this particular tree right and similarly i say every fan in the room is working what does it mean it is set of all fans in the room do you understand that therefore this quantifier for all for each etc okay it actually quantifies okay something of this set so the first thing for example i would like to write let l be the set of all leaves on leaves on the tree okay then what we are saying is for every little l in l or x in l okay we are saying this way i write yeah l is green the this is a for way we write the first statement okay every leaf on the tree is green what is l this is a set so what are we saying every element of the set has a property what is the property the property is this the leaf is green okay similarly next let us look at capital f to be the set of fans okay in the room okay then what is the quantifier says for every f in capital f that is every fan every element in the set f is working do you follow that so mathematicians always abstract this okay so that you can apply in much more general statement so any all these statements are of the following kind what is the kind that is you have a set x and you want to say for every x in x okay x has some property okay p is a property x has p p is a property here for this statement the property is the leaf being green and here the property is the fan is working okay it's a working fan that's a property of the fan do you follow that okay so how did we negate each of the stand statements you see that when i wanted to negate when i want to say the first statement this statement is false okay what did i do i'm oh, sorry this statement is false okay this statement is false what did i do i said there exists an l in l so that l is green is false that means l is not green that is x does not have the property p do you follow that yeah and similarly when i look at this statement okay when i want to negate this what does it mean i said every fan is working then i have to say there exists a fan so that the property is false the property is it's a working fan that's false that means f is not working so you do you see a pattern the pattern is this if i have this one it's a negation okay it's negation start like this there exists x in x so that x does not have property p i will not write apostrophe etc now i will simply write that do you understand this okay please spend some time we will do mathematics in a minute so pause review proceed quickly review all these three statements you will have comfort in some kind of mathematical statement you will see that suppose let us look at an example i say a real number alpha is an upper bound for a non empty subset a of r u for all x in a x is less than or equal to alpha that is for all x in a have a property what is the property less than or equal to alpha right 
So when I say alpha is an upper bound, what I am saying? Every element x in A has a property. That is, so if I want to say alpha is not an upper bound and of A, what what should happen? If it's an upper bound for every x has the same some properties, therefore there exists some x for which the property is false. So what does it mean? Therefore, that means if there exists an x in A so that or we will write x is let the equity alpha is false. That means by law of trichotomy x must be greater than alpha. Do you understand this? Yeah? So if alpha is an upper bound for A, that means every x in A has a property, common property. That is, so if alpha is not an upper bound for A, that means there exists at least one element. This statement is false. That means there is at least one element in A for which this property is false. But law of trichotomy, if x is not equal to alpha, x is not less than alpha, then x must be greater than alpha. Do you understand? Quick PRP. Pause, review and proceed. So we already saw the use of it in mathematics. Okay, these are the things if you learn, for example, when you learn real analysis, you may not have appreciated these things. When you go out to real analysis, measure theory, etc., and functional analysis, you will have problem because you have not understood this kind of thing carefully. Okay? So, the purpose of this lecture is quickly go through these things. Okay? Right. Now, let's look at the other body pair. So, if you notice, what did you do? We started, we looked at the statements of this form with the universal quantifier. For every x in x, x has the same property p. Okay? What is the negation? We saw. So, what should be the counterpart I should look at? I should look at the other one, which starts with the next quantifier, namely there exists. Right? Let us do that. So, this is the second thing. Okay? So, let us say there exists a ripe mango in the basket. Okay, I have a basket full of fruits. Okay, mango fruits if you want. I want to say there exists a ripe mango in the basket of fruits. Remember, it's a mango season I'm lecturing on. Okay, that's why. Okay, so if it is false, what does it mean? I have a basket of mangoes. I look at it, then I have to say, give me any mango. So if I say this is false, what should I do? I take a mango, okay, this is not ripe. Take another mango, this is not ripe. Take the, and so on. You understand? That is, give me any mango from the basket, it is not ripe. Do you follow that? So, this one, how will we write? Let M be the set of mangoes, okay, in the basket. Right? Then what am I saying? Give me any x in m, then x is ripe. Sorry. Have you are looking at there exists. There exists x in m, so that x is ripe. Okay? So what are we saying? There exists in the set, there is at least one element with some special property. What is the property here? X is ripe. So if it is false, what does it mean? You cannot say all mangoes in the basket are not ripe. That's a very wrong way of saying. You understand this? Therefore, the negation, think of this, how will I prove? Okay, I have a basket of mangoes, I want to say there is at least one ripe mango. If I say it's false, what does it mean? The only way I can prove is take each and every mango and show that it's not ripe. So, the negation, we will say, give me any mango. So, you see that? So, here I will not write, for all x in m, I will not write, read, read like this. I will write, given any mango x in the basket, okay, x is not ripe. Okay, don't read this as for all or for each. Okay, even though it, the, the symbol is always read as for all, but in the context you should learn. Okay. Please, this is a very important thing you have to learn. Okay? For example, when I say there exists a rich person in this room, if it is false, you cannot say all are not rich. All are not rich simply means everybody is not rich is also is not correct. 
you understand if i say everybody is not rich if there are 10 so people then i want to say the none of the 10 people is rich that's not correct if i say everybody is not rich it may mean somebody may be rich somebody is not rich so if i want to say there is a rich people there is a rich person in this room it is false I should say, take each and every person. Give me any person in the room. I have to show he is not rich. Don't ask me what is rich. Okay? You understand what? Okay? Are you following? Yes. Okay. Suppose I say same thing. Let us say say this set of fans in the room, and I want to say there exists a a fan so that X is not working. Right? Okay, so what does it mean? You take the set of fans in the room, and you want to say there is at least one fan which is not working. If it is false, what does it mean? Okay, you will. Okay, you tell the electrician that their fan is not working. You repaired it, but one fan is not working. Then he will challenge you. Show me a fan. So he will take each. He will switch. He will switch on each and every fan and show it is working. Right. So it's a negation. How does it go a negation? Negation say, says, "Give me any x in F, and x is not working. Is part that means x is working. So how will I read it? I will read it. Given any x in F. Do you follow that? So what are the statements you have looked for so far? Okay, the the abstract version is the following. Okay." You want to, this statement is there exists an x in x such so that x has some property p. So it's negation. How will I read it? Don't you write a for all symbol? How will I read it? For all x in x, I don't read it. I will read it. Given any x in x, x does not have property p. Okay, let us look at it in an example now. Anna, okay, we will look at a mathematical example. I say a subset A of R, of course, assume non-empty, is bounded above if there exists a real number which is an upper bound. Do you understand that? So, how will I write it in terms of quantifiers? I say A is bounded above in r if there exists alpha in r with what property alpha is an upper bound of a you follow that yes so what is the negation of the statement i want to say a is not bounded above that means if it's bounded above I have to find at least one alpha. Therefore, you give me any real number alpha. What do I know about it? It is not an upper bound of A, right? You follow that? Yeah. So A is not bounded above in R. Yeah. Give me any alpha in R. What do I know about alpha? Can it be an upper bound of A? If it is an upper bound of A, then A is bounded above. Therefore, alpha is not an upper bound. of you okay i think it's time for you to pause review and proceed okay and mathematics is unfortunately is not this simple okay there will be more than one quantifier in a statement okay so now the third case is okay more than okay two, two or more quantifiers in a statement and how to negate them right right the first thing even before negation it's a tra I want you to look at the following two statements. Okay, what I want to say is, so what are the possibilities? Something like for all, for all, there exists, there exists, or for every, there exists, or 
there exists for all. These are the possible two, assuming two quantifiers are involved. You understand that? What I want to say is the order in which the quantifiers appear make a difference. The order makes a difference and it will be drastically different. Okay? What do I mean by that? I will give a very real life example so that you will appreciate, then we will put it into mathematics. Okay? Right. So, let us look at that. So, this is not going to matter, right? Only this one. Okay? Let us do that. So, let R be set of religions. What are the religions? Like Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, okay, Buddhism, or Christianity, or Islam, or Judaism, and so on. Okay? These are the set of religion. Okay? Let P be the set of people set of human beings okay people on earth right now let us look at two statements let us make sure that you understand that for every x and p there exists an r in capital r okay so that okay x oh, x follows the religion p religion r do you understand this statement? What does it mean? Try to understand. Do not get carried away by the symbol. You give me any human being on earth, I want to say there is at least one religion. I will for the time being, the religion also includes atheism. Don't say that I don't belong to any religion. Then atheism, agnosticism, all, all are religion for me. Okay, given any person on earth, there is at least one religion so that X follows that religion. It may be agnosticism, atheism, or Hinduism, or Judaism. I don't care. You understand that? Yeah? So, if you take a okay, Kumarasan, okay, let us say, let's not worry about it. Let's take a Hindu sadhu, then he will follow Hindu religion. If I take uh, Mr. James Watson, he may follow Christianity. If I take Ali Akbar, he may follow, he may follow Islam. And if I take uh, Balvinder Singh, he may follow Sikh Sikhism. So, for given any person, okay, there is a religion and the person X follows that religion. Or Do you follow that? Now, let's look at the other way around. There exists an R in R such so that the same thing I am writing. For all X in P, X follows R. What does this statement say? The statement says there exists one single religion R so that you give me any person on earth, he follows that religion. Do you see that? The second statement says there is only one religion everybody follows, whereas the first statement says given any person, there may be a religion which he follows. You follow that? Given X1, he may follow R1. Given X2, he may follow R2. Okay? R1 may not be equal to R2. Now, what do you think will be good for the uh, piece of human race? If the second statement is true, uh, everything will be peaceful on earth, right? At least now. Okay, do you follow that? So, what, what do you understand? You should understand the way we write the order of quantifiers is important. Okay? Let us quickly give an example. Alright? Suppose I say A is bounded above in R, okay, what did we say? There exists alpha a real number, so that alpha is an upper bound, that means for every x in A, x must be less than or equal to alpha. See, I, you see that I am putting brackets, okay, it's like a nested brackets, okay. When do you say A is bounded above in R? Just now we saw. There is an alpha in R, so that alpha is an upper bound. What is the meaning of alpha is an upper bound? For every x in A, x must be less than or equal to alpha. You see that? Therefore, what is the order of the quantifier here? There exists followed by the for all. Right? Suppose I, by mistake, a student write like this. He says A is bounded above in R if for every x in A, okay, there exists alpha in R, so that x is less than equal to alpha. Suppose he, see, he will say, sir, I wrote this. There, there exists alpha in R, I wrote it. For every x in R, I wrote it. 
and for all x less than or equal to alpha i wrote it so that they are the same you may claim all right do you will you accept it you not you should not accept why you see that if this is the definition of boundedness bounded above then every set will be bounded above because you give me any x in a I have to find an alpha with what property x must be less than or equal to alpha. Therefore, I can take there exists alpha. Take alpha equal to x or x plus one, such so that x is less than or equal to alpha. So that means what for every x has the property. What is the property? I can find an alpha such so that x is less than or equal to alpha. Therefore, every set, not every set, will be bounded above according to this definition, which is wrong. Do you follow that? Please spend some time. These are the kind of things you would have never come across carefully earlier. So spend some time. Pause. Review. As I suggest all the time, I hope you watch this with a group of friends, at least one or two more. And whenever there is a PRP, stop it and review the material. Okay. Right. Now we want to look at the negation. Of such compound sentences, that is sentences which use more than two. All right? Let us look at. Okay? Let me just look at a, a small thing, uh, an example. Okay? So if I say, I want you to understand this. So let us say, suppose I have, I am in sitting in a. Okay? There is a, an orchard. Okay? There are rows of trees. Okay? These are the trees. Trees must be green, right? Right? Okay. And then what I want to say is, okay, in each row, okay, there exists a mango tree. You see that? Now there are two quantifiers involved. What is the first quantifier? Row. Take this row, take this row, take this row and so on. Right? And remember for each quantifier there is this uh, underlying set. What is the underlying set? R is the set of rows. You understand that? Right? Then what do I claim? Take any row in the set of rows. R has some property. R has some property. What is the property? So I take this row, then what do I have? There are many trees, then I have to say there is at least one tree, okay, which is mango tree. You understand that? But now you want to say there exists, right? There is a mango tree, therefore it's a quantifier. Therefore, there should be an under underlying set. What is the underlying set? If I take this row, this is my row, then I am looking at the trees of the row. So I can call T suffix R. T stands for trees and trees of the row small r. You understand that? Then what do I want to claim? There exists some tree here, okay, which is mango tree. Okay, therefore what, how will I write it? There exists a T in TR, so that T is mango tree. Do you understand this? Okay. This kind of careful, precise way of writing you may not have seen. So spend some time, go through it. Okay, if you. Now I have a class of students. There are a lot of benches. Okay. There are students sitting in each of the benches, right? Okay, then I want to say, for example, in each row, there exists a student from Telangana. Okay, it's a kind of a national level program, so there are a lot of students and they are all sitting on benches. Then, in each bench, let me call it bench, in each bench. Okay. Now, can you think of writing set of benches? You can write capital B, small b. Then, once I take the bench, then we have to look at set of students on the bench. So, I can write it as suffix B. 
these are the set of students on the bench this is my b right then what do i want to say there is an s in sb so that s is from telangana that's it okay you should be able to think of such statements look at our book there will be a lot of such example to make you understand now so i want to negate it how do i negate see it's very simple okay you don't get confused what did i say the statement said in each row there is a mango tree i want to negate so the first thing is in each row that is each row has some property so this statement is false mean there is at least one row which does not have the property do you understand that yes in each row there is a mango tree that means each row has a property so that means there is at least one row for which it is false therefore there is a row for which the statement is false what is the statement look at the trees in that row i want to claim that there is at least one mango tree that means that is false now what is the quantifier there there exists therefore what is the negation give me any tree in that particular row it is not mango tree do you follow that go slow okay since it's a crash course and within a limited time i have to finish i have to really go fast okay what is the negation negation of the mango tree example negation is okay i in each tree that means there exists a row okay r with what property r does not have have property p what is the property there exists an r and r and r r has a property what does it mean that means take this is the r this is the set the set of trees in r okay and what do i want to say there exists a tree which is mango tree that means give me any tree in this row it's not mango tree that means given any t in tr t is not a mango tree do you follow that compare these two statements the st first one unfortunately you know they are at far apart so the original statement is for every r in r okay there exists t in tr so that t is a mango tree this is the original statement now do you see its negation right so you write if you write it very carefully okay you can do this okay right now this is where you have to be careful in mathematics most often it has become a standard practice for example this they will write okay for every row in every row okay let's not worry about is do you understand this i'll come to that in a minute yeah let us look at this example yeah one example okay we said a is bounded above in r if there exists alpha in r so that for all x in a x is less than equal to alpha so this is a property okay there is a real number alpha with that property what is the property give me any x in a x must be less than equal to alpha right okay now i want to negate it so i want to say a is not bounded above in r so what does that mean so there exists a real number with some property that is false that is how will i write it it's not bounded above in r if give me any alpha don't read it for all give me any alpha in r so that that alpha does not have the property what is the property it should have for every x in a x must be less than equal to alpha that is alpha must be greater than equal to x that is false that means there exists at least one x in a so that x is greater than alpha do you understand please pause review proceed okay please again believe me you have very prp please stop it even if you are uh, watching only uh, sitting alone stop it go back review and work out and understand okay all right now for example if 
Okay? Now, just to contrast, let me give a... All of you have seen group theory. Axioms of group theory are a definition, right? So, what is the existence of identity? Existence of identity says there exists an E in G so that for every G in G, what we have is G star E equal to G equal to E star G. Do you understand that? So, what is the order in which the quantifier occurs? So, there is a single element E which is going to work for every G. We follow that. Whereas, this is existence of identity. Whereas, existence of inverse, it says, give me any G, that is given any G in G, there exists a G dash in G, so that G star G dash equal to identity equal to G dash star G. See that the order. This is another thing you should always understand. That is, the moment I start in a sentence of this kind, for all x and x, something happens, there exists something y somewhere, then this y may depend upon x. You understand? For example, if I take z under addition, if you give me 4 as g, then g dash will be minus 4. If you give me g as 0, g dash will be 0. If you give me minus 2 as your g, then g dash should be 2. You see that for every g there exists, this in general may depend upon. Okay. I am not saying if this g1 and g2 are different, g1 dash and g2 dash are different. That is not true. Please listen to me carefully. What all I am saying is this g dash will depend upon g, but I am not claiming if, if G1 is not equal to G2, then G1 dash is not equal to G2 dash. I am not claiming that. Okay? Let us give, give one more example. Okay? Suppose F is a function from X to Y. Okay? When is I say? When do I say it's on to? All of you will have the mantra, right? Every Y has a pre-image. <laughs> okay? <laughs> right? But let us write it carefully. If, what do I want to say? For every y, give me any y in y, I want to say there exists an x in x. With what property? y must be equal to fx. Yeah? This is on to. Do you follow that? Yeah? Therefore, when I say f is not on to, that is I am negating this statement. What should happen then? Every y in y has some property. That is for that point there exists y in y. Okay, so that what happens? This property is false. That is, there is an x with some, so that y equal to f. That is false. That means, give me any y, give me, sorry, give me any x in x, then this property is false. y is not equal to f. That means, given that there is some y for which no element is going to be pre-image. That is your popular definition. Do you follow that? Okay. So, p r p. And if I have more complicated statements also, I can do that. For example, if f is continuous at a, f is, let us say, at 0, let us say, f is from r to r. Okay? What does it mean? For every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta positive so that for all x where in the set minus delta to plus delta, I have mod fx minus f0 must be less than epsilon. Do you see that? You see for all followed by there exists again followed by for all. Yeah? Usually you can see the textbooks will write it in a slightly different way but it's always a good idea to write down quantifiers in proper order in the beginning of the statement. For example, this one they will write for every epsilon greater than 0 there is a delta positive so that mod fx minus f0 is less than epsilon for all x in minus delta to plus delta. This is what they will write. You see that? But there are actually three quantifiers. What is for epsilon? And there exists. And then for all x something has happened. Therefore, it is always a good practice to write the quantifiers at the front in this way. Therefore, this is the one and this is the second. Okay. 
and this is the third so if i want to say f is not continuous it's a child's game now the you said for every epsilon something must be true that is false that means there exists epsilon positive so that whatever is said is here is false that means i wanted to say there is some delta with some property that is false that is give me any delta positive okay it does not have the property what is the property the property said there for every x something must happen that is false that means there is an x in the interval minus delta to plus delta said that mod fx minus f0 is greater than or equal to epsilon okay please spend time and go through and review this if you have done these things you will be reasonably comfortable but please please review okay now i am coming to the last two things see there are two statements let us say s1 and s2 and there is a way of combining in mathematics in even real life that is one is by using and the other one is using or yeah you understand this now the first thing you should understand is this is a new statement okay and this is a new statement t okay so when is yes true yes is true if and only if yes one is true yes one and yes two both are true okay when is t true if one of s1 s2 is true this is what you have to understand i will give example do not okay this is not a very you know it's a, actually this is all common sense all right so suppose i want to buy a mobile which is less than 10000 rupees and also it has 4, 4g right if i reject if some shopkeeper shows me a mobile and i say no I don't want that. What does it mean? Okay. So, if I want to buy, it should have both the properties. What is? This must be 4G mobile. That must be true. And it should be the price must be less than 10,000. That must be true. Do you understand? Right? Very good. So, when I say S1 and S2 is a new statement, it is true. That means both S1 and S2 are true. Do you follow that? Right. Now suppose I want to say S1 or S2, right? Now I want to study, a, let us say, a PhD, uh, either at this you know at this university or at this university. Okay. So if I get any one of them, then I am I'm happy. You understand that? Yeah. So I'm a, I am happy if I get admission either in this institute S1, in this institute, in this university. X or in this university Y. Now, if I get admission in any one of them, I am true. I am happy. Are you following? Therefore, if one of them is true, I am happy. Okay. I, if I get both, then I will choose which one I want. But if I get one of them, I am happy. Okay. Usually, I give a somewhat uh, uh, may not be a good example, but I, I usually give this. Suppose I am looking for a son-in-law for my daughter, then I may look for a person who is handsome as well as highly educated. right or if i may look for a person let's worry about i am a kind of a, a money oriented person i am looking for a, a boy who is either rich or who has a very high income salary okay very high salary yeah. right so if a boy comes if i think this is a good match for my daughter what does it mean one of them must be true if he is rich i am happy or if he is as a sal job which gives him good salary very high salary i am happy if he has both of course i am happiest yeah do you follow that this thing this is all common sense now using the same thing you can go to the next step so when i say yes a statement s1 and s2 this is false what does it mean if s yes is true it means both s1 and s2 must be true right both s1 and s2 are true so if it is false what does it mean at least one of them must be false do you understand that okay therefore negation of s okay so s is false implies either s1 is false or s2 is false that means 
okay this is what you would have seen in your logical symbols but i will not write it okay this statement let us say s1 negation or s2 negation is true s1 is false is s1 negation s2 is false is s2 negation you understand that and now these are two statements statements i combine them using r okay this statement is true oh, don't get confused it's very common sense that means what did i say i am looking for a mobile which is less than 10000 rupees and 4g so i don't i don't want this mobile what does that mean either it is not 4g or its price is not less than 10000 rupees you understand that yes sure okay i'll give mathematical example in a minute okay that will be the end of the lecture right and similarly t is false what does it mean t is false when is t is false if one of s1 or s2 one of them is true then t is true therefore if t is false what does it mean s1 is false and s2 is also false that means s1 false and s2 false again go back to my concrete example i have a boy b okay i am looking for a boy who is either very rich or who has a high income salary okay this boy i reject why would i reject if he if he is rich will i reject will i reject him no if he has high income salary will i reject him no so what does that mean if i reject this boy he does not have either that is being rich is also false and having high income salary is also false do you follow that yeah okay now let's look at the final example with that i will stop there will be a lot of examples you should look at the book but as i said it's a crash course <coughs> let us look at real number system in which we have law of trichotomy what does it say give me real numbers x and y then okay one of the following is true what is true either x equal to y or x is less than y or y is less than x and exactly one and only one of them is true given real numbers either x must be y if x is not y then x must be less than y if x is if both are false then it must be y less than x because only one happen right right yeah let us look at uh, a concrete example no i will give an easier example i just thought of the easier example let us look at the set a this interval okay a to b okay now this is a subset of r now given an element x in r when does x belong to a you will simply say a is less than or equal to x less than or equal to b you understand that yeah but notice that if this x belong to a that means x has to satisfy two conditions if and only if x must be greater than or equal to a and x must be less than or equal to b do you understand that if x has to be in the interval a b then x has to be has, has to satisfy two conditions okay the first condition is x is greater than or equal to a second condition is x is less than or equal to b right so x belong to a is a true statement in front of this is a true statement and this is a true statement so this is like your yes this is like your s1 this is like your s2 therefore if x is not in a that means this is false okay negation of yes what does it mean that means x greater than equal to a is false by law of trichotomy that means x must be less than a that is x1 commonly meant or x less than or equal to b is false that means x is greater than b you understand that so what does that mean that means x is either here or here either here or here you understand that for example x must be may be greater than or equal to a but it may also be greater than or equal to b you follow that so i have a b 
Okay, x may be greater than equal to a, but x may also be greater than equal to b. One condition is satisfied, but the other one is not satisfied. Please go through it. Okay. So last example. Suppose I have a union b. Okay. When does x belong to a? A union b. This statement is true. If one of x is in a is true, or x is in b is true. Do you understand that? This is true. If and only if. This is true. Therefore, x is not in a union b. That is negation of this statement. What does it mean? x is not in a and x is not in b. Do you follow that? So, if I have a statement S, yes, which is S1 and or sorry, T, which is S1 or S2, the negation, negation is S1, negation of S1 and negation of S2. Do you follow that? This is S1, this is S2, this follow. So, this is the last example, the same thing. Now, suppose x belongs to A intersection B. What does that mean? That means x is in A. This statement must be true. And this statement must also be true. Right? Therefore, this statement is false. That is, x is not in A intersection B. What does that mean? That means this statement is false or this statement is false. That means x is not in A. This is S1. This is your S. This is S1 and S2. Therefore, x1 is not in A or x is not in B. That means S1 okay, is false or S2 is false. Okay. So, PRP and the last one, just as a kind of thing, if I say my T is S1 or S2, okay, and I said T is false, but S1 is true, what does that mean? This should imply S2 is false, because if you have T is yeah, can sorry, sorry. I'm very sorry. There's a mistake. I wanted and <laughs> okay. Uh, let me repeat. I'm sorry for the mistake. Just as a time pressure is sitting. Suppose T. Suppose T is true, right? But I know S1 is false. So what can I conclude? Since T is true, you already know S1 is false, therefore S2 must be true. Do you understand? This is the kind of thing you will use in my uh, proof. You want to say x, x is x has property P or x has property Q, then you will say, suppose x has property P, nothing to prove or get it. Therefore, let us assume x, is, x does not have property P. Then I have to prove x has property Q. Have you seen such a proof? Think about it. Okay. Have a good day. As I said, please review each of the things and you will be happy with that. Okay. So, please review at each PRP. Go back and review and then go do. And if you, have, if you can get hold of the book on the foundation course in mathematics, please buy that. You will see a lot of good examples. And as a, whenever you have as a hobby, you can keep reading it. You will begin to understand mathematics in a much, much better and deeper way. Okay. Take care. Stay safe.